I'll crack on straight into my presentation anyway. An Idiot's Guide to Embodied Carbon. I'm the idiot here, not you, just to be clear. We've been going as a sustainable building magazine publisher since January 2003 was the first issue. And we've been in the UK since 2012. Over time, as a green building magazine publisher, we learned that not all approaches to notionally sustainable building work. And there's a need to kind of subject uh, preconceived notions, long-held notions sometimes to, to, to the scrutiny of, 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 of evidence-based approaches. And we got drawn, as many people would know, to the Pacifist Standard and rebranded and expanded uh, into the UK back in 2012. And it was very much, you know, Passive House Plus. I mean, so the plus element of it, that's subsequently been rebranded to Passive House Plus Sustainable Building. And uh, we, we cover other aspects of sustainable building too, of course. Um, in the last few years, having, I suppose, increasing confidence that as an industry, we, we understand now how to crack the operational energy issue in new build and in retrofit um, and to quantify that accurately. Um, uh, we've moved on to embodied carbon. When we made this transition, there was a long-standing green architect in Ireland who proposed that we write about another standard called Active Hus, um, which I was interested in, I, and I, I fired back with a list of questions about what methodology was used, what was the ventilation approach, what, what were the space heating targets, and so on. And the response I got was, um, Jeff, this is a very left-of-brain approach, uh, which, is, which is the problem. You can't quantify everything in life. I don't know what the embodied carbon of a good conversation with a friend is, for instance, you know. Um, but, but we do need to try and apply these principles where we can, and in buildings we can. We're talking in terms of CO2 equivalent, which is of course the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases converted into an equivalent amount of climate kind of damage, essentially. One of the key things we need to look for, uh, and these are really the building blocks for a life cycle assessment, are environmental product declarations. Now they're not available for every material yet, but rather than just having a cert claiming that a product is green, what we have with an EPD is a standardized, independently verified audit of a product's overall environmental impacts. They're, they're very challenging to obtain, depending on how complex the product is, I suppose. And they give you th things now, in a standardized way, they give you um, values such as the kilograms of CO2 equivalent per square meter, that would be the functional unit, for instance, or per watt peak in the case of a solar PV array or what, whatever it may be. And there's increasingly stringent rules being laid down now, product characteristic rules, to enable you to fairly and consistently compare materials. So that, that's, I suppose, really important. There's been a really weird transition happening. I've noticed it in Ireland in particular, and it will be happening in the UK too. I've had conversations with either directly with developers or with uh, suppliers for big developers, the biggest developers in Ireland, um, some of whom will be operating in, in, in the UK as well, the likes of Ballymore uh, Properties, for instance. Um, uh, Heinz, big American property developer, very active in Ireland now, who all of a sudden are starting to move uh, on life cycle assessment, um, on, on looking for environmental product declarations for products. But it is amazing to see among developers in Ireland how quickly this is, this is changing. Um, I know companies who are, who, are, who are under pressure from developers, uh, heat pump suppliers, uh, you know, building fabric product suppliers of different kinds who are under pressure to get EPDs um, just to be able to be involved in a project in the first place. A few key documents, I mean, you can have the slides afterwards. Rick's, their methodology has, has been really, really important. It's worth reading that. It's a big document, but it's worth reading. Um, that's meant to be being updated, um, but that's been paused for, for now, I gather. The scope is really, really important. So we were used to seeing at a stage architects coming forward with uh, building LCAs where they present a mass timber building, for instance, and they'll just show you an embodied carbon score for the superstructure, you know, and claim that it's a carbon negative building. Um, you can't get away with that. The RICS document defines what the scope must include and then what's possible to include within it. REBA, with their 2030 climate challenge, define what they require people to, to submit. And it's, it's basically everything in this list, which goes through from facilitating works through to finishes, excluding external works and, uh, and also demolition at the start of the project. There's assumptions in the RICS document about lifespan. The assumed reference study period is, uh, is 60 years for different building types. Now, we have to hope that the buildings that we're designing now will last a lot longer than that. There is some data for non-domestic buildings in particular to, to show that 
the lifespan can be much shorter, often not because there's a problem with the building construction quality wise, but because of uh, of growth and densification requirements and so on. So, but that we have to assume will have to change uh, in, in the kind of post-apocalyptic future that we're heading into. Just to explain how this works in the context of building life cycle assessment. So the conception and gestation stage, this is the emissions involved in manufacturing the products, in transporting them to site, and in the construction and installation process. At this stage, we can have high confidence about the, the emissions because it's possible, especially if you've got EPDs, to get really good quality data on, on how much emissions have actually been released into the atmosphere and also um, how much is stored in, you know, how, how much biogenic carbon is stored in components um, in the case of you know, timber and uh, timber-based kind of products. When you get into the life stage, which deals with uh, emissions released or sequestered by materials during use, that, there's a kind of a funny one here with concrete-based products. Uh, there's a process called carbonation, many of you be familiar with. A lot of carbonation can be very problematic for, for concrete. Uh, if it's structural concrete, it can cause the, the concrete to fail, so you have to be careful about it. It can cause corrosion of rebar, for instance. But it's acceptable in certain uses. But it, you can get a fair amount, depending on the concrete product, you can actually get a fair amount of, of, uh, of, of sequestration, depending on how, on how dense it is. If it's very dense, for instance, and if it's buried in a wall and not exposed, you don't get as much. But I'm a bit wary of this because it, it can happen over long time spans and the cement industry is inclined to kind of try and claim probably more than it's really entitled to. B2 and B5 is maintenance, repair, replacement and refurbishment. Um, I should say B6 and B7, operational energy and water use, they're excluded in the likes of the REBA standard from their embodied carbon totals they report on them separately. When you get into B, you start making big assumptions. Um, how long will a component last? And how polluting will the manufacture of replacement components be? Well, we don't know. You know, it's important to look at it, and it's important to think about, about the quality of components and the quality of the work from a detailing perspective, um, the installation process and so on, to, to try and ensure that you get a longer lifespan. Then in the death stage of the building, you know, you've got deconstruction and demolition, transporting away materials, you've got waste processing for reuse, recovery or recycling, and then you've got a disposal. More big assumptions are being made here. How long will the building last? How polluting will the disposal be? Timber suffers in this stage, actually, the way it's treated in the life cycle assessment methods, because you get all the benefit in the gestation stage of the stored CO2 from when the trees were growing. And of course, that isn't a license for just clear felling. You know, uh, we, we, th there's nuance in all of this. Um, but um, whatever you do with the timber, um, whether it's incinerated, landfilled, or, uh, or, or recycled at the end, it, it's assumed to be released into the atmosphere, or rather it moves beyond the boundary conditions of the life cycle assessment if it's recovered. So the, the sequestration passes on to the next use. Um, <laughs> which now, what I mean by grave robbing is this kind of um, nightmarish concept of taking body parts and making a new entity out of it in the future, you know, a new building, um, which is great, of course. Um, it's Frankenstein monsters is, what, I guess, what we need in the future. Um, but um, but those, those benefits are not considered within, within the, the, the targets that we're looking at. So that's, that's just how I would divide those tables up. That's my own twisted way of, of thinking anyway. I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of projects that we've been through, because we've been getting embodied carbon calcs done. I even did some with, uh, under Tim Martell's uh, uh, stewardship using the AECB's uh, embodied carbon calculation tool recently as well on a project. This is an unremarkable project, Cavity Wall uh, Strip Foundation's uh, social housing project. What it's remarkable for is that the architect was willing to subject it to the scrutiny of daylight and to have complete transparency applied to how the project was built. So I got, when we were writing about it, the haulier's log um, for uh, excavation of the muck that was taken away from the site. And there were 30,000 tonnes for this 42-unit social housing project in, in Wicklow and in, on the east coast of Ireland. 30,000 tonnes of soil excavated from the site, which seems extraordinary to me. I spoke to some builders afterwards who said, no, that's, that's, that's normal enough, based on the side of the, of the project. Transported, and I got so the hauliers log. I got the, the the site, obviously location, and then the different dumps that the soil was taken away to, 
and, it w and then calculated using Google Maps what the likely routes were and got the fuel factors from base. Uh, in the UK, I have them, and I con consulted an Irish uh, transport emissions consultant, too, who verified them. And we're talking about, in this case, 127,000 kilometres. That's more than three times the circumference of the Earth to take soil away from one project. And it worked out at about 5% of the budget of the project and about 5% of the carbon budget as well, interestingly. Second case study that I really wanted to focus in on, great project. This is by an AECB member, Alan Budden of Eco Design Consultants, Carstone House in Bedfordshire. We wrote about this in, in the magazine as well. It's Passive House Plus certified. It's a bit bigger than we'd normally like to publish, um, but it's got an awful lot to commend it. So, so it's 230 square meters, Larson Trust timber frame with cellulose insulation and a small heat pump, air source heat pump, using CO2 as a refrigerant, which means that the global warming potential, the, the equivalent amount of CO2 of the, of the refrigerant in the heat pump was, was basically nothing. And a PV roof, and I do mean a PV roof. Um, in the first five years, they made a net profit on their energy bills, including charging an EV. But, you know, this year I think they do expect to pay something, given Ukraine. The wafer was a big, big chunk of the emissions. You know, these things will change as well. Uh, and um, once you get manufacturers getting EPDs, quickly they, you st you're going to start to see progress happening in terms of re making reductions. I think, anyway, the point is that one of the crazy things about this calculation, you know, any, anybody who's got even a, a polluting EPD, you know, a relatively polluting EPD now, um, when we're doing a life cycle assessment for a building, the idea that if we're replacing it in 25 years or 30 years or whatever it might be, that it's going to be made in exactly the same way with the exactly the same em emissions, then it's, it's nonsensical. The precautionary principle is, you know, it's understandable and I get that, but it doesn't really make sense, I think, in this case. There needs to be a way. So I, I think wh what we need to do in this case, you know, Look, get calculating so we can have these discussions. Pick apart the calculations you know, that other people are doing. Peer review is really important with this too. There's lots of tools available. One click LCA have a good tool too, but uh, my own preference from what I've seen will be pH ribbon because it's Excel based. You can reverse engineer the calculations and really kind of pick, pick them to pieces. Um, and if you've, got, if you've got a building put into PHP already, it really speeds up the whole process because you've got a lot of the heavy lifting already done in terms of the, the areas and stuff added. EPDs really matter. Try and get them wherever you can. Uh, there's some areas where uh, they're available, some where they're not. We've just seen a first EPD published, to my knowledge, globally um, for uh, a heat recovery ventilation system, for instance. Um, um, and there's, they'll be slow coming for things like heat pumps, but they are, they are coming. Query the assumptions made after Module A, after the gestation stage. If a building is someone's offspring, we don't know what they're going to do in the world. And um, I know it's morbid sort of talking about the, the death of something that you're trying to create effectively, but we do need to grapple with that. Um, and I think there is an argument for, for, for placing more emphasis on, on in the way that Letty have done, um, on Module A targets. Thinking about the full cradle to grave, but I think Module A's, you know, the, the, the gestation stage stuff is the stuff that we can, we can have most confidence about. And that's the stuff that we're putting into the environment now. So I think that's where a lot of our emphasis should lie, really. Thank you anyway for listening.